Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Magic the Gathering, told through a card from every set. Part 18 covered 2022, so this video will cover all of the standard legal sets that were released in 2023. Starting out, Phyrexia All Will Be One was one of the most aggressive sets we've seen in recent years, with its blisteringly aggressive pace mirroring the monstrous brutality of New Phyrexia. March of the Machine was the final culmination of the Phyrexian arc, bringing heroes and villains from across the multiverse together to fight hand in hand for survival. We then returned to the wilds of Eldraine for some more adventures, which were just a bit less broken than our first trip to the plane. And finally, 2023 closed out with a trip into the Lost Caverns of Ixalan, where we crafted up a new perspective on the 2017 plane. Just a quick reminder, this series only covers sets that were released into Standard, so Tales from Middle-earth is going to be in another video. I also won't be discussing March of the Machine The Aftermath, because it was a micro set and not a full-on product. Plus, even acknowledging that that set exists leaves a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. I'm sure you know why. Anyway, let's get going. Phyrexia All Will Be One wandered into stores in February of 2023. The first part of the finale of the Phyrexian arc, All Will Be One returned us to New Phyrexia, formerly known as Mirrodin, formerly known as Argentum. In an attempt to stop the Phyrexians from launching their invasion of the multiverse, a crack team of planeswalkers infiltrated the corrupted world, hoping to bring it down from within, using a super weapon based upon an ancient and terrible design. The hopes of the multiverse rested on this brave alliance of heroes as they took up the task with grim determination and a solemn sense of duty. And then they completely screwed it up. Just wow. Read the story, it is embarrassing how poorly they do. Luca, if your own internal monologue describes something as a twisted construct that seemed to blend the worst parts of machine and organism, do not try and become its friend. It won't end well for you. <coughs> the only thing faster than the rate at which the protagonists made mistakes in this set's story was the speed of its limited format. With a phenomenal selection of highly powerful removal spells at common, a large quantity of powerful low-cost creatures, and, of course, the return of poison counters, Phyrexia All Be One games had a tendency to wrap up pretty quickly. The card which we're going to use to represent Phyrexia All Be One is an absolutely fantastic card, Atraxa Grand Unifier. This Phyrexian Angel costs one mana of every colour apart from red, and then three additional mana. Atraxa has seven power and seven toughness, as well as a smorgasbord of keyword abilities. Specifically, Atraxa has flying, Vigilance, Death Touch, and Lifelink. And when she enters play, you reveal the top 10 cards of your deck, and you can put a card of each different type revealed this way into your hand. So a creature, an artifact, an enchantment, etc, etc. Like Tarmogoyf before her, Atraxa actually gave players a sneak preview of a card type that didn't currently exist when she was revealed. The reminder text at the end of the card lists Battles as a card type that Atraxa's controller can add to their hand. Given that the first, and currently only, set of battle cards wouldn't be printed until March of the Machine in April, this served as a cheeky preview of things to come, and got many players excitedly speculating. If you've been playing Standard on MTG Arena, you've almost certainly run into an Atraxa or two. A powerful win condition, Atraxa Grand Unifier brings the game plan of any aggro deck she's up against to a screeching halt. The fact this card has Life Link means that even if her controller's on the verge of death, they can make an abrupt recovery. Vigilance means she's always able to block and provide yet more healing using lifelink, and flying gives Atraxa some useful offensive evasive potential. The only ability here that's not really pulling its weight is Death Touch, which doesn't really need to be there, but I guess the card needed to justify the black mana pip in its cost somehow. Atraxa's card draw ability enables her controller to reload their hand, letting them load up on removal and counter spells to stop the opponent from trying anything. When Atraxa hits the field, unless the opponent has a removal spell immediately available, she can single-handedly turn a losing game around. But Atraxa's impact isn't limited to standard. For many years, Gristlebrand was the reanimation target in modern, but Atraxa Grand Unifier is putting up some pretty stiff competition. Like the Innistradi Demon Lord, she provides a burst of card draw, and a powerful 7-7 body as she enters play. With her more powerful selection of abilities needing to be weighed against the fact she probably won't provide quite as much card advantage. The card is also doing all sorts of combo -y nonsense in Pioneer, getting cheated into play early through a cheeky combination of creatures with Delve and the card Neoform. Although Phyrexia All Be One was, on the whole, a very fast-paced set, its most notable card reminds us of the power that big flying baddies provide. March of the Machine marched into stores in April of 2023. This is it, the final set in the Phyrexian arc. As Elish Norn launched her invasion of the entire MTG multiverse, unlikely allies united to fend off their extraplanar enemy. We had a vampire teaming up with a dinosaur, a holy warrior teaming up with a frog, and a nature spirit teaming up with... Uh, Another frog. Although these team-up cards didn't actually do anything mechanically new, it was a nice way of getting as many of Magic's iconic characters as possible together all at once to face down the Phyrexians. 
what was mechanically new were the new battle cards. Battles all enter play with a certain number of defence counters on them, and under the protection of one of their controller's opponents. Battles all do something when they enter play, and then, when their counters are removed, they flip and do something else. Some of them become creatures, some of them become planeswalkers, artifacts or enchantments, and some of them even become sorceries. While battles of a new hotness released in March of the Machine, I'm not going to go with one of them as my card to represent the set. None of them were hugely competitively impactful, apart from maybe Invasion of Amonkhet. They'll almost certainly come back in the future though, and given that all of the battles we've currently seen are sieges, any new battles we see might have some new mechanical twists. Maybe in the future we'll get ambushes, skirmishes, raids, or something like that. In fact, it was actually quite hard choosing a card to represent March of the Machine at all. I could have gone with one of the double-sided Praetors, but honestly not many of them see a huge amount of usage outside of Commander. Shoulder had seen a bit, but nowhere near as much as Shoulder of the Apocalypse, who I've already discussed. As Yuta Takahashi's World Championship card, and a powerful card in its own right, I could have gone with Fairy Mastermind. I also could have talked about Itali Primal Conqueror, and how it can either be blinked for a whole bunch of value, or just smack your opponent in the face to poison them to death. But no, instead I've decided to talk about a different dinosaur altogether. Ancient Imperiosaur. Ancient Imperiosaur is a 7-mana 6-6 with Trample, Ward 2, and Convoke. For every creature that convokes it, Ancient Imperiosaur enters play with two plus one plus one counters. This makes it the centerpiece of an incredibly wonderfully named modern deck called <laughs> Dino Whack. The essential game plan is to rush out as many creatures as possible as quickly as possible, so that the Imperiosaur can convoke itself out with them. So naturally, the deck runs a full play set of Ornithopters and Memnites, along with cards like Burning Tree Emissary that refunds itself and ticks up your storm count in order to summon several squirrels with Chatterstorm. Voldaren Epicure is also a useful inclusion, as it generates artifact tokens as it enters play that can be sacrificed to Koldofa Rebirth or Gleeful Demolition to be split into three 1-1 Goblin tokens. Once you've got about seven creatures out, you convoke them all down to play your Imperiosaur, which will get 14 plus 1 plus 1 counters, and then you give it haste, using either Goblin Bushwhacker or Reckless Bushwhacker, and then attack the game. The Ancient Imperiosaur provides the dino part of the deck's name, while the two Goblin Bushwhackers add the whack. It's not the most viable modern deck, but honestly it's really fun to pilot and really cheap to assemble if you don't care about blinging out your land base. You're not going to win a pro tour with this deck, but you might win a game or two at Friday Night Magic. Everyone ventured into the wilds of Eldraine in September of 2023. Now the original Throne of Eldraine, as we discussed before, is a fun set, but one that massively ramped up the power level of the game. It introduced one of the most infamous planeswalkers of all time, and invited us to look upon his works in despair. Wilds of Eldraine, in contrast, isn't quite so impactful. We're still living in a post-Eldraine 1 world, so we're already used to sets where one drops are ridiculously powerful, and bomb rares have abilities that are more convoluted than James Joyce's Ulysses. That's not to say Wilds of Eldraine didn't give us some pretty strong cards though, just that its power exists in a world where the dial has already been turned up to 11. There were two primary candidates I felt I could have gone for when discussing Wilds of Eldraine. Agatha's Soul Cauldron and Up the Beanstalk. Agatha's Soul Cauldron is... Oh boy, it's a lot. TLDR, you can use it to exile creatures with activated abilities from your graveyard and put plus one plus one counters on creatures on your battlefield. It then gives the creatures on your battlefield the abilities of the cards it's put into exile. So you can give all your cards Ginger Brute's ability to become almost completely unblockable for one mana, or do a bunch of infinite combo nonsense by combining it with Walking Ballista or any of the cards that can use that card's effect as a win condition. See? Nice and simple. Akiva's Soul Cauldron also costs 40 plus dollars, so the power it provides does come at a bit of a price. While the Cauldron is certainly a very powerful card, I've decided to venture off in another direction and make up the Beanstalk my card to represent the set. This uncommon, that only costs a few dollars, managed to do what Agatha's Soul Cauldron couldn't, and get banned in modern. For two mana, up the Beanstalk's an enchantment, which draws its controller a card when it enters play, and then draws them another card whenever they cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater. So what made this cute little cantrip too powerful for modern? I'll quote the December 4th article which announced its ban to the world. Up the Beanstalk is one of Modern's newest inclusions, subsidising many cards in the format that cost 5 or more mana. However, it's rare for players to pay anywhere close to 5 mana to cast the cards they're using with Up the Beanstalk. To unpick this quote a bit, in a world where Up the Beanstalk can trips and then only draws its controller extra cards when they hard cast 5 mana or greater cards, it wouldn't be a problem. That's why it's legal in Standard and Pioneer. But in Modern, you're not going to wait patiently and play your 5 mana cards on turn 5. You're going to be rushing these cards out as early as you can and as often as you can. The card Fury, which is banned alongside Up the Beanstalk, illustrates the kind of card it was usually cast alongside. The cycle of Evoke Elementals are from Modern Horizons 2, and can be evoked out, meaning they're cast 
Their enter the battlefield effect goes off, and then they're sacrificed, at the cost of discarding a card, rather than paying any mana. Up the Beanstalk was typically run alongside four copies of both Fury and Solitude, the white card from a cycle, that also costs five mana. The cost of evoking out these cards is almost functionally negated while up the Beanstalk's in play, as you end up net neutral in terms of card advantage, as the card you discard to evoke out the elemental is immediately replaced by the card the Beanstalk draws for you. The fact that up the Beanstalk immediately replaces itself is also a big part of its power, as it keeps your tempo rolling. It can even be cascaded out with a shardless agent, which is always fun. Unfortunately, there wasn't a golden goose waiting at the top of this beanstalk, but rather a swift banning. But how much this is this card's fault, and how much it's the fault of the evoke elementals is up for debate. Up the beanstalk remains unbanned in Pioneer, where there are no evoke cards in sight. In November of 2023, players discovered all of the wonders and horrors hiding deep within the lost caverns of Ixalan. Despite my personal fondness for it, the original Ixalan was not a popular set. Its typal mechanics were broadly seen as making drafts too on rails, and it was often seen as too simple. Lost Caverns of Ixalan initially wasn't even intended to occur on Ixalan at all. Mark Rosewater has shared the vision design document for the set, which states that the underground is on a plane we've never visited before. He writes commentary underneath, stating, Most of the time when we start vision design, we know what kind of world we're designing for. Sometimes it's a return to a familiar plane, and sometimes it's a new plane. It's not often that we design for one and have it printed in another. Even more odd, if we choose to make a change, it's almost always done during exploratory design or vision design. Planning the set around a new plane and switching to Ixalan after vision design handed off the set is a very big exception to how the process normally works, and played a big role in why the set changed so much from this document to print. So why was the decision made to take this initially unknown setting and transport it to Ixalan? Partially, it was because the decision was made to give Lost Caverns of Ixalan an action-adventure vibe, <laughs> rather than a horror vibe. Rosewater writes that stories focused on exploring underground worlds tend to fall into one of these two camps. Given the large number of horror Magic the Gathering sets which exist already, not to mention the upcoming Duskmorn House of Horrors due for release in 2024, the decision was made to make Lost Caverns of Ixalan more of an Uncharted or a Tomb Raider experience than something like Darkest Dungeon or Amnesia. Ixalan is a world of swashbuckling and fun that fits this kind of story nicely. There also seems to be incredible passion for the world of Ixalan on behalf of Magic the Gathering's creative team. The Planeswalker's Guide to Lost Caverns of Ixalan, published on the 10th of November by Miguel Lopez, demonstrates an incredible degree of passion for the plane in its immense 20,000 word length. Ovidio Cartagena, one of Wizards of the Coast's senior art directors, also speaks with incredible passion about wanting to convey Latin and Mesoamerican stories and artistic and cultural motifs with the set. First, I, I want to stress, like this, this is a subject matter near and dear to your heart. Yeah, very much. I, um... Uh... I have been thinking about the set since I've been a Magic player. The set has like a very rich, colorful palette full of contrast and and uh, some geometric patterns typical of modern indigenous textiles. Uh, we 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 wanted to evoke many things. We we knew Miguel and I. We knew that we had this set to make our our statement about Latino America. The way we feel the love we have for for our culture, uh, and so. We brought part of our life experience into the set, but he codified the colors, the Maya spiral, the lines, and many of the other details that that you put the camera and there's a lot of references to to codexes, a lot of references to structures, Machu Picchu, there's even like sky gondolas, many things that that come from people who traveled to South America, people who grew up there, people who lived there. Personally, I'm glad we're returning to Exelon, and that we're getting a quite literal deep dive into the world. So which card will be used to represent the glittering ancient wonders of the cavernous realm beneath Exelon? Perhaps one of the ancient and powerful deep gods? Perhaps a treasured artifact buried within the earth for centuries? Perhaps a big old dinosaur? No. In my view, the most impactful card from Lost Caverns of Exelon is just a person with a torch and a mace. I'm talking, of course, about Geological Appraiser. For four mana, Geological Appraiser is a free two human artificer that discovers free when it enters play. Discover is Magic the Gathering's designer's attempt at a second mechanic like Cascade. Although, for reasons we're about to discuss, I'd hesitate to call it a fixed version of Cascade. Both Cascade and Discover allow you to dig through the top cards of your deck until you reach something with a certain mana value and then cast it for free. Cards with Cascade allow you to cast anything with a mana value less than their own. So Shardless Agent has a mana value of 3, and can thus cascade into any card with mana value 2 or less. Discover cards, meanwhile, all have a value written on them, 
Let geological appraisers discover free, meaning it can fetch any carb of mana value free or lower. There are a few other technical differences, like Cascade being a cast trigger whilst Discover is a keyword, and Discover allowing you to put the fan card into your hand, but broadly, the two are very similar mechanics. As has been well discussed in this series at this point, casting cards for free cheats around the mana system that's fundamental to the balance of magic. Discover would prove to be just as powerful and problematic as its predecessor, and Geological Appraiser were getting up banned in both the Pioneer and Explorer formats on the 4th of December, less than a month after its release. But why? Well, Geological Appraiser was the centrepiece of a contentious combo deck which rocked Pioneer for the few weeks in which it was legal. You build a deck where the only cards that cost three or less are the cards Eldritch Evolution and then either Glass Pool Mimic or Mirror Image. To enable yourself to still have some plays available in the early game, include some split cards like Bedeck, Bedazzle and Consign slash Oblivion. For the purpose of Discover, these cards have a mana value equal to the combined cost of both of their effects, meaning that Geological Appraiser will never cast them, but you can still use them to stop your opponents from killing you before your plan has a chance to get going. With your deck built like this, you just need to mulligan until you have a hand that will enable you to cast Geological Appraiser on turn 4. It will then Discover as it enters play. If it hits a Glass Pool Mimic, the Mimic will copy it and then Discover free again, continuing the cycle. If it hits an Eldritch Evolution, you can instead sacrifice your Geological Appraiser to fetch a Trumpeting Carnosaur. The Carnosaur is a 7-6 Dinosaur with Discover 5, so that when it enters play, get ready to start digging through your deck again. The Carnosaur will then dig up either another Appraiser, an Eldritch Evolution, or a card that will copy it, let you keep discovering again and again. Once you've flooded your field with a sufficient number of Carnosaurs, Geological Appraisers and Clones, you just need to wait until you discover another Eldritch Evolution, which you can then use to fetch the final piece that glues that X combo together, Doomscar Titan. Doomscar Titan gives all of your creatures plus one plus zero, oh, and more importantly, haste, enabling you to attack the game with the massive board you've sprung out of your deck in a single turn. The Appraiser was banned to gut this combo deck and stop players from using it. This strategy is reasonably consistent, with the only major risk being the need to survive until you can cast the Appraiser to get the win. There's also a very slight chance the combo can break if you flip into too many consecutive Eldritch Evolutions without getting any clones. It also simply takes ages for the combo to go off. It's dull for opponents to watch people playing this deck click through all the sequencing online, and even more tedious to watch it unfold in person. Finally, it leads to repetitive play patterns, which generally aren't fun. This deck will always win in the exact same way. Whether you're mourning the loss of this torch-bearing appraiser, or you're happy to see them go, they certainly raise a valid point that the real horror waiting to be discovered in the dark caves beneath Ixalan is man. Dun dun dun! That's my Black Mirror end of episode twist for you there. So there we have it, all of the standard legal sets of 2023. Well, apart from, <clears throat> you know. Overall, I think 2023 had some highs and lows. For actually all be one wasn't to my personal taste, games wrapped up just a bit too quickly, and also I don't feel Lost Caverns of Ixalan and Wilds of Eldraine are exactly the greatest limited formats of all time, but March of the Machine and the Lord of the Rings set were both, at least in my opinion, absolute home runs. That's about the coldest take in the world I'm aware, but yeah, March of the Machine and Tales of Middle-earth were just great sets. I've not done a poll in a while, so let's conclude this video with one of those. How did you feel about the Phyrexian arc which concluded in 2023? Did you love every second we saw of those villainous vivisectors? Did you quite like the multiverses of oily enemies, or were you entirely ambivalent about them? I know not everyone follows Magic's story hugely closely. Of course, you may also have really disliked every second we spent fighting these wannabe Yogmoths, or even absolutely despised Norn and her, um, norn tourage. Let me know, and I promise I'll try to have more videos out this year than I did last year. Goodbye everyone.